Okay, good morning um, and welcome to ICTP. Welcome to, to the city of Trieste. I'm Fabio Vlacci. My name is Fabio Vlacci. Um, I was born in Trieste. I study here. And currently, I have a position at the University of Florence. Um, but I'm always happy to be at ICTP and to give a contribution to this, uh, this diploma courses. And this is the third year I'm, I've, I'm giving this course in complex analysis. Um, some information. The schedule and the calendar depends on many factors, including the fact that I have also to teach in Florence, so I have to go back and forth, and I cannot be here for the whole term. However, I will be mainly here in Trieste. My room is the room number uh, 118, 119, the same entrance. I write it here, okay, room number. Can you read it? This is another experiment. Not only they are taking me on the, on the they take a track on what I'm saying, but I'm also a track on what I'm writing. Uh, this is an experiment also to me, and also for me, but I think it is a good idea to have uh, um, the, uh, the, the blackboards, say, set of pictures, blackboards, and I can, uh, and I can give you the copies at the end of the, the, the week, say, on the lesson. So you know that, We'll have 20, 20 blocks of lessons together in this course and in other courses. Uh, you will be supposed to, uh, well, to attend the lessons, if that's obvious, if you wish, and also to solve some of the exercise I will give you um, say, uh, weekly, approximately, okay? Uh, so, uh, a good way of communication is to use the, uh, of course, the um, email. I will have your email address at ICTP and I give you mine. Okay, my room is this. I share the, the office with Eva Sinchic just to be. The room is in front of the, sec of this, the room of uh, Alessandra Bergamo, one of the two secretaries of um, the math group. And I leave you my email address. This is the address from the University of Florence, and this is at ICTP. Okay, so the secretary will provide me the, uh, your email address at ICTP. But if you wish, in the meanwhile, you can contact me using this account. Okay, so uh, it, it is not easy for me to remember your names and even to pronounce them, but I will uh, normally answer quite uh, frequently to, to questions uh, by, by email. Okay, of course, you will also, the, 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 you can request some appointment in case you need some some extra explanation or whatever, your simply information. What, um, I will be happy to, to, to meet you in my room. And, but the only fact is that I have to know it in advance. For instance, on Friday, I have to run up immediately after the lesson. And next week, we'll have only lesson on Friday, not on Monday, because of some overlapping of classes, OK? They moved the, the, the calendar somehow. They changed the, They moved the, the, the room. They move the say the, the, the classes from rooms to, from one room to the other, and so there are some overlapping. Okay, uh, extra information, nothing, I would say. <laughs> um, as I said, I'm very happy to be to to be part of the of this diploma program. I, I think that you already met a director. Consider this uh, program one of the best activities. Uh, uh, at ICTP. ICTP is a very well-known uh, international scientific, and I think for you it's a good opportunity to be here. You can meet a lot of visitors, you can join the conferences, and of course we have also to, to work a little bit. Well, back to business. Um, 
So the aim of the course is to give you basic notions in uh, uh, the theory of complex valued functions of one complex variable. I assume that most of you already know something about complex valued functions of one complex variable. If all of you are very familiar with all the classical stuff, well, we can also switch to something more complicated in several complex variables. So it depends on your background. So normally the class is not very homogeneous in the backgrounds, which is obvious for obvious reasons. Um, so I will start quite slowly. And if you find it quite boring, uh, please tell me. And uh, okay, I uh, either accelerate or change the subject. Okay, a little bit. Uh, well, for sure. Okay, what I'm assuming as a background, general background. I'm assuming that you know basic calculus in well, real calculus and some basic facts in topology um, and some elements of algebra. Okay, so I think this is granted. In in case I can give you some some references. For the course, I've not, I'm not following just one book, one textbook. I've taken notes from different books, and this is the idea. I will provide you of a list of books, textbooks for, as a reference for the course, as soon as I, I, I know what I have to teach, in a sense. Okay, normally, uh, uh, we, we, um, we are asked to we are asked to, to provide you basic notions in complex analysis and not in advanced several variable complex analysis, which is quite different. But if you don't know any notion in, in, uh, in uh, one, complex value, uh, one complex variable theory, it's very difficult to understand several complex variables. So, so my idea is to start with one complex variable, okay? And uh, first of all, uh, okay, so this is the welcome page, number zero. Oh, I have to remember to put a note here. So this is first lesson, page one. All right. So, about names, okay? Why uh, complex numbers are considered complex and the real numbers are considered real? Uh, the two sets are not... <laughs> either real or complex in some sense using the standard terminology because, well, this terminology went in use for historical reasons in different times. But the idea is that we are accustomed to the realm of the numbers, even though, as you perfectly know, the real numbers are introduced axiomatically. And the complex numbers are considered more complicated with some additional information, but sometimes they also contain good properties of real numbers, okay? So normally, real numbers, the set of real numbers indicated by R, real numbers, and I use C to indicate complex numbers. Normally also, I, I believe that you identify the real numbers with the real line, with the line. Hmm? And it is natural to consider the complex number to be, okay, very good. So this plane is, has also a name, normally it's called Gauss plane. So, typically, a complex number is an ordered pair of real numbers. Hmm? So I consider plane, which means R2. So the pairs of numbers A, B, of, of real numbers, ordered pairs, and this, of course, shows you that the complex number are not, sorry, 
the complex numbers are not d very different from the real numbers, okay? So many properties will be, um, many properties of the complex numbers will be um, uh, um, will be obtained by using this fact, okay? The point is that the real number, the real numbers have also an algebraic structure. We can sum real numbers and we can uh, multiply real numbers. Hmm? This is in the axiomatic definition of the real numbers. What about operations with the ordered pairs? Hmm? Well, if you want ordered pairs, means vectors in R2. So how do you sum vectors in uh, R2? Well, in Rn, you simply sum uh, component-wise. Good. So if I have a b, I define this is the definition of the sum in C, that the, the sum of two pairs is the sum component-wise, where the sum here is the sum in R. Okay, so it is quite easy to verify, and I leave it as a, an exercise, that the complex number with this sum here is an abelian group. I'm sorry. Now, passing to multiplication. Well, multiplication is not as natural as it may uh, uh, appear because when you have two real numbers, you have uh, composition given by, and with some properties, of course, huh? because the real numbers form a field, so they also group um, with the multiplication. Right? Now the idea is that well, if you have a pair of real numbers, ordered pair, you have a vector, right, in the plane, and there is no natural multiplication. You can multiply a vector by a scalar. In fact, R2 is <coughs> a vector space. But to define this product, you have to, some, in some sense, put a rule. Huh? And we define this to be AC minus BD and uh, AD plus BC. So, I invite you to verify that this multiplication, this is definition, okay? Is associative, commutative, and for any pair different from the pair 0, 0, which represent a neutral element for the uh, sum, there exists an inverse. An inverse means that you take a prime, B prime, <coughs> such that Where one, zero is the identity. And C. This is probably something you perfectly know. And what, what are the news, good news? Well, <clears throat> if you prove all these properties, then you have another field. Just good. 
Some strange news is that you start from two pairs and you have a multiplication of some special numbers, complex numbers, which provides you a square, which is minus one. Uh, when you identify a zero with a in R, like we did here, you can see it quite easily. Okay. But what are the motivations for this multiplication? This is something artificial in some sense. Huh? I want to give you some motivation. First of all, I want to remind you, well, <clears throat> I want to show you that if you adopt that multiplication, you obtain that the, the pair 0, 1 has a square which is minus 1, which is as minus 1 in R. And this is something completely un unusual for the real multiplication. Any square is a non-negative number. Hmm? On the other hand, you also know that if you consider algebraic equations, so polynomial, equal to zero is fine, you are looking for roots of polynomials, so then you have an algebraic equation. Well, if, if you consider, if you, are, if you are considering the possibility of finding roots and the real numbers, not always this is possible, huh? as you know. The quadratic equation 1 plus x squared equal to 0 is no real solution. But since we have discovered that using pairs, so using complex numbers, we can find a square which is somehow minus 1, we have some hope that we can find a solution also for this quadratic equation. First of all, let us start from a more generic setting. A quadratic equation. Well, we're assuming that A is not zero. Hmm? Then I think that you all know that the two solutions are obtained in the following way. And everything is meaningful when b squared minus 4 times a times c is greater or equal to 0 in the real numbers. Otherwise, here we are writing something which is not real. Hmm? What I want to show you now is that we can transform into after a change of parameters and of variables. Okay, so my idea is the following. I oh, forgot to put here one, three. My idea is the following. Then first I consider ax squared plus bx. for a squared. Well, first of all, I can, well, yes, I can, def either I can divide by a everything because a is different from zero, okay? And I make it simpler. Sorry. So I have x squared plus b over a, x plus c over a, equal to 0. Since a is different from 0, okay, I can do this. Then 
uh, add and subtract b squared over 4a squared, hmm? which completes somehow the, the square we have here. So I have this. And this can be written as x plus b over a over 2a, sorry, squared. Okay? And here I have minus Okay, so please note that this is exactly what it is here, and it's called the discriminant, right? Now, I call this number here D, and this number here, this, sorry, this uh, vari new variable here, call it U. So I have the U squared equal to D. Hmm? Uh, when I'm considering something which is not uh, so, some, some uh, quadratic equation which is not solvable in the real, I'm assuming that b squared minus 4ac is negative, right? So this is this number here is d here minus d becomes d on the right hand side is negative. Okay, so put last line put minus d is positive, and I consider as new variable x is u over square root of minus d, and this is meaningful because minus d is positive, and I have, okay? And so, I'm reduced to this equation. Four. Okay, so this is somehow the quadratic equation which cannot have real roots. But then I consider, this is notation, standard notation, but please tell me if it is familiar to you. And then I consider the, the ring of polynomials. Uh, with real coefficients. And of course, x squared plus 1 is one of this polynomial. Now I consider the ideal generated by x squared plus 1. This is the set of all polynomials of this form, x squared plus 1 times ax, where ax is a polynomial. All right? What do we know about uh, uh, this um, ideal? Well, we know that this polynomial, x squared plus 1, cannot be split into polynomials of degree 1. It is irreducible, so the ideal is prime. Good, very good. So this is the background in algebra I'm requesting. Since it is prime, you can consider the quotient, right? Okay, so let me just write here, this is irreducible as a polynomial in R, and hence A, uh, sorry, I is prime. 
Therefore, I can consider this quotient here. which turns out to be a field. Hmm? This is a field. Now, how can we represent the elements of this quotient? Well, you take a polynomial, you divide it by x squared plus 1, and the rest is what you have as a representative. But as a, as a rest, you have a um, polynomial of degree at most one. So the representative of this is the class, sorry, the representative in a class is a polynomial of degree at most one. Okay, so I write it here just once formally and b and a are real numbers because bx plus a is a polynomial in rx. Okay? Good. So, <clears throat> hope everything is somehow known or affordable. Now, what I'm doing is, well, I know that this is a field, but what if I sum two elements and this quotient? I sum two elements like this, and I remember that this is, by definition, the class represented by the sum of the, repre the representatives, right? So it is quite easy to obtain this. Okay. Nothing new. Let us pass to multiplication. Now in this case, things are a bit more interesting because when you multiply the two representatives, then you obtain the representatives have degree one, at most one, okay? And in, in some cases, you have a, 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 in a product, uh, as a result, a polynomial of degree two. So you have to take the quotient, right? All right, so uh, I forgot to put this here. But what I have is BD x squared, right, plus BC, BCx plus ADx plus AC. And this has to be divided by x squared plus 1, right? So I do like this. I add and subtract BD, okay? So that I have here BD x squared plus BD minus BD plus, and then I sum up, sum the, the coefficient of x. I have AD plus BC times x plus AC. And this is representative and this quotient. So that I have BD x squared plus 1, which cancel, because it is, huh? And what is left is AD plus BC, x plus AC minus BD. It is then... Okay. 
you have a question? Yes, good. Someone mentioned to me that the polynomial in the quotient is quite simple. You can only identify x squared with the equation by negative 1, like in this case. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. I, I can repeat the question when I understand it. <laughs> what what I, okay, I. That, that's correct. That's correct. But formally, that's what you are doing. You are, yeah, that's correct. So uh, your colleague is saying that since you have this quotient over here, hmm, any time you find an x squared, you can replace x squared by its minus 1, right? X is just I, but I is not is not in the business now. I'm, I, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. This is formally the uh, the the construction of a quotient of polynomials, so of real polynomials, real co uh, um, uh, polynomial with real coefficients. But I agree with you. What I have done is nothing, but well, to make it appear here, I added B D. I added BD here and remove BD here. So that, correct, instead of x squared, but I think that formally this is what you, you want to do. A good idea, thank you for, for pointing out. X turns out to be something similar to I, but I has not appeared here. Even even in the in the in the previous notation, I never use I. Well, this was done on purpose, just to okay, to make the introduction more. And anyway, the idea is correct. So this, if this is correct, and it should be, because I'm using I'm using something that well I, I will do a lot of mistakes. So please. Uh, stop me when you don't understand what I'm writing and feel free to make questions. Uh, uh. But this gives you a motivation why multiplication is the one we have chosen for the pairs, ordered pairs of real numbers. So if I consider the representative uh, A plus Bx, to be put in correspondence with the pair AB, then I discovered that what I've done is the following. Then I had C plus DX, CD, that the multiplication is what I have here. So AC minus BD, AD plus BC. Okay? This is the motivation. So just to, to use the notation, so six, the pair of uh, the ordered pairs of uh, real numbers with the sum and multiplication introduced so far can be, in fact, considered as this quotient here. And good news in this uh, new field, larger field, we can solve all quadratic equations huh? because the formula we have can be solved because we have a square uh, of a number which is negative. But bad news, uh, since we are working with essentially with vectors, we are not on a line, we are in a plane. And therefore, vectors cannot be ordered hmm, like points on a line. Huh? There is an orientation on, on, the, on the real line, 
and you can compare, say, one number is greater, smaller, or equal to the other, but this is in the case of the real numbers. For complex numbers, this is not completely meaningful. Hmm? So historical remarks, thank you for, so it was, okay, this was known. And people use some strange symbols, like the unfortunate symbol, square root of minus one, which is, of course, not good. So uh, as far as I remember, uh, in the first time le the letter I appeared was in 1777. Euler. It was Euler who said, well, because this number cannot be real, he said, well, it is imaginary. And he used the, the letter I. And he wrote in a, in a letter and adopted this symbol. Hmm? Then numbers became known as imaginary numbers, because they are not real, but also real numbers are not real in some sense. They are imaginary as well. So it, I think it was Gauss who decided to call them complex numbers, because if we, if we use this notation, this is the number 0, 1. Okay? This is the pair 0, 1, which with, this multipl with the multiplication introduced so far is the one, the number whose square is minus one. And I pre definitely prefer this to this, this to this. Hmm? This is something, okay, misleading. Okay, so if we accept that this is I, as you probably all know, then the pair, ordered pair A, B, which uh, is the general element of the set C, is also A times one zero plus B times zero one. When you regard the vectors as vectors in as uh, vectors of uh, vector space of the real vector space, A and B are scalars in this sense. So then we have this number here, which can be regarded as one in R, and this number here, so the two generators, okay, the orthonormal basis, and this number here is I. So that any complex number AB has also this representation, A plus BI, which is very common. And normally the letter for the, for the complex number is Z. Why Z? Well, because we already use X and Y. No, well, <laughs> probably because Z uh, uh, is the first letter in the, in the word Zahlen in, in German, which means numbers. Okay, so Z is numbers. But you cannot use Z, capital Z, or blackboard Z, to indicate this Z, because it was already used for the relative numbers, okay? Okay, good. Now. We can represent then any complex number in what we call the Gauss plane. In the Gauss plane, we consider A to be the first coordinate and B to be the second coordinate, right? So this is the number Z. A plus I B, which means this is the representation, okay? Good. I'll, normally the, okay, observe, remark, it's obvious. If B is zero, the complex number is real, okay? So, if A is zero, <coughs> it, the complex number has no, as we say, is no real part, because A is called the real part, and B is called the imaginary part, so purely imaginary, okay? Which means, respectively, that the point Z is on the real axis. Second case, it is on the imaginary axis on the vertical axis.
axis. Good. All right. So, uh, some facts which I leave you as exercises. Uh, page six, right? Well. Wow. So, what I want to okay consider this map and this map. Well, notation is quite natural, say. T and S are real numbers, and on the right-hand side, you have a complex number. Okay? So, uh, call it them. Uh, okay. So, the question is, are these functions injective? One to one, whatever. Do they preserve the structure? Because R is a group field. Huh? So, are they homomorphism? I'm not indicating on purpose if they are homomorphisms, if they are group homomorphism, uh, field homo whatever, okay? So please, uh, I invite you to think of this too. So if we identify the real part and the imaginary part with the projections on the axis uh, and vice versa, if starting from the real number, go to a complex number, what are the algebraic properties preserved and what are not? Okay, good. Are the ex uh, other exercise, this is exercise one, say. Another exercise is the following. Okay, for algebraic general facts, we know that C is a field. Okay? So, any element different from zero, okay, as, as an inverse, okay, and a reciprocal, okay. So I invite you to consider the generic reciprocal. To write down what is the real part of the reciprocal of AB and the reciprocal of so, sorry, the imaginary part of this reciprocal as well. And I also invite you, exercise three, is to find real and imaginary part of 1 over z squared when z, of course, is different from 0. So you take any element in the plane, normally use x and s for the real part and y for the imaginary part since we are using uh, the, uh, the identification with the Gauss plane of, of a complex number. Take a, a complex number different from zero. Zero means the ordered pair zero, zero. So, it is not possible for Z to have both real and imaginary part zero, but they can, okay? And something more, well, minus 2i as well, okay? So I invite you to make some calculations. And this is a way to better understand uh, how to work with the real numbers. Uh, with, sorry, with complex numbers. Uh, okay. Before continuing, let me also tell you that um, historically, after the complex numbers, there were some attempt to extend to other sets the multiplication. 
in, more, in order to have an extension of complex numbers as it was done for the real numbers. For real numbers, complex numbers, and something else. But it was very hard. In fact, it was almost imp it was impossible to find a multiplication. Then it was proved it was impossible to find a in, a, in R3. So that is, well, I have R. I have R2, which is the complex. Well, with some efforts, I can extend everything in R3, right? Well, this is not possible. If you want to have an algebra, so a division algebra, so if you want to have a, a reciprocal right and a left reciprocal, this is not possible. But it was by accident that uh, Hamilton discovered that this is possible well, for in R4, right? For the quaternions. He introduced the quaternions. So for the quaternions, this is possible. However, for the quaternions, uh, the quaternions were discovered uh, in the late 80s, so quite recently. When Hamilton was looking for uh, a solution in R3, of course, this is the normal situation. Mathematician is trying to prove something and he proves something else. But <laughs> anyway, the, the quaternions are now quite known and studied, uh, even though uh, they, they, are, they are recent, the, the theory is say, developed at a certain uh, stage and used and applied in, in physics very much in physics, because quaternions are not have a multiplication which is not commutative. It's not anti-commutative, it's not commutative. And so when trying to generalize and generalize, there is another set of the quaternions so from R, R2, R4, R8. So seven imaginary units are added to a real part. And this set is known as a set of octonions or Kali numbers. And this set is really odd because multiplication uh, introduced in the, Kali, in the Kali numbers is neither commutative nor associative. So everything is very much complicated. But, sorry. But luckily, we will deal only with complex numbers. Okay, and with some analysis on complex numbers. I'm interested for other reasons in analysis on the, over the quaternions. And uh, well, you can imagine it's difficult to, to define anything without the commutativity property. Think of, uh, well, uh, deriv derivation, for instance. Huh? <laughs> in fact, the, 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 there, there were several there have been several attempts to, to, to have a notion of derivation. And uh, the class of functions discovered to be derivating, the, the differentiable, say, in the quaternionic sense, is either very small or very large or very bad. So <laughs> it's up to you. So only recently there were some good uh, um, developments of the theory. And, well, maybe in one of the next lectures, I will, I will, I will show you some some facts on the slides, and I will send you the just because I like it. Okay, you are not supposed to to do anything on in a non-commutative uh, field, which is odd. Not associative; it's even is even unaffordable for for many mathematicians. Okay, but uh, what you have to know is that there are no extra algebras after quaternions and octonions. Okay, so you don't have the possibility of divide on the right, on the right, on the left, different uh, inverse reciprocals. Uh, so the complex numbers are somehow the good numbers after the real numbers, and they are the only ones. Okay, okay. Sorry for this um, uh, parenthesis. Now, as a matter of fact, it is natural to consider 
given a complex number z, the complex number which is symmetric with respect to the real axis. Same real part, opposite imaginary part. And this complex number is denoted by a z bar and called conjugate. Okay, so if you want to use the notation AB, the conjugate is the pair A minus B. This is something new because for the real numbers, the conjugate coincides. So, uh, two no actually, two complex numbers, sorry, a complex number which coincides with the with the with its conjugate is in fact a real number. Okay? Which means that the imaginary part is zero. And why conjugate? Well, because if you conjugate twice, so if you consider the conjugate of the conjugate, well, geometrically this means that you are taking this symmetrical and then Algebraically, you can also see this, a, b, a minus b, a minus minus b, that is a, b. Okay. And as I said, if z and z bar, I use z bar, terminology is z bar. Unfortunately, bar means many things in mathematics, but well, in complex and I typically z bar means the conjugate. If this occurs, then z is a real number. Okay? Good. Now, something very easy to prove is the following. Take the complex number z and sum it with its conjugate. So the imaginary part cancels and you have twice the real part. So is x if z is x plus i y. And x is also denoted in this way, a real part of z. A real part of z. Good. Similarly, if I subtract to z, z bar, okay, what I, I have here is, well, x plus i y minus x plus i y, right? Minus minus, huh? So I have two i y. That is to say that the imaginary part of z y is obtained in this way. Okay, this is simply a relation. So you can express the real and the imaginary parts of a complex number in terms of some subtractions of the, the number and its conjugate times a constant. Okay? What is also very important to, to observe is that if you multiply z and z bar, then you can either adopt this notation here and then make the calculation following the rules given for the multiplication, or remember that if z is a plus i b, z bar is a minus i b and multiplication of real and imaginary part is simply the multiplication of in the reals and remember that i squared is equal to minus 1. So if this is 
the new ingredient, multiplication becomes like this. So z times z bar is a squared minus i a b plus i a b. I'm using the uh, commutative properties. You see how often and natural it is, and I think of me working in the, on the quaternions and struggling with the, okay. And then I have b, b, b squared, minus i squared, that is minus minus 1. So this plus b squared. Pardon me? Sorry. I, I'm sorry, you sure? Sure, yes, sorry. I, wa I was, I was uh, talking about uh, commutativity and forgetting about the sign. Yeah, right. So what is left here, and this is important to remember, is that this is a real number, and it is a non-negative real number, which represents in the Gauss plane what? The length of the vector, okay? the modulus of the vector. So if this is z, this distance from the origin is this number here, which is normally also denoted by modulus of z squared, right? So the modulus of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And this is the square root of a non-negative real number, so it's a standard square root, okay? Some very easy uh, properties of the, of the modules, which I, if, if you don't feel comfortable or familiar with this, I, I invite you to, to verify or to think about it, is the following, some properties of the modulus of z and the modulus of z bar is the same. This is, well, for several reasons, but think about this. Uh, second point is that the real part of z, uh, well, minus the real part of z is small or equal to, sorry, just the opposite. <laughs> well, this is true, but The real part of z is in between minus modulus of z and modulus of z, of course. Hmm? And similarly, the imaginary part of z, okay. When we have a, the equality here, which means that the real part of z and the modulus is the same, what about z? It's purely real. Purely, it's real. It's a real number. Hmm? Good. Another obvious fact is that if you take two num, if you take a couple of uh, complex numbers z and w, then this, what is true? Only the Only as the sign, only as the The product of two complex numbers has a modulus, which is? The product of the two moduli. The two moduli, good. Um, let me also tell you that I forgot to, to write it down before. What is the conjugate of the product? the product of the conjugates, and what, oh, sorry, what about the conjugate of a sum? Good. What about <coughs> the sum, the modulus of the sum? Less than the sum of the moduli. This is the triangle inequality. Very good. Good. So, last exercise is well, consider 
z plus w squared modulus squared plus z minus w squared. And what is this? Some parts cancel, right? Correct. Exactly. Exactly. So it is two mod of z square plus mod of w square. What is important to, to remember, okay? And in case to use. But if I repeat, some if anybody uh, feels that this is new, well, it's a good it's a good training to make the calculations once in a in your life at least, <laughs> to be, to, to feel confident, okay, no, and this kind of, of, uh, of stuff. Good. Now, what is the next step? Well, we have thus that any complex number is can be considered as a vector in R2. And we automatically used, adopted the uh, Cartesian coordinates to represent what? The point. So we, we apply the, 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 the vector on the origin and we represent the, the vector knowing the position of the, the ending point, right? So in some sense, we, we are using uh, a misleading terminology because if you consider an ordered pair, you're considering a point, not a vector. Vector is a column, okay? But well, just a matter of uh, transposition of, of, of our matrix, okay? If, if you write A, B like this, this is clearly a vector in R2. And when I write A, B like this, well, this should be a point. But, well, we identify the point, the ending point of the vector. Okay, this is the vector. Of course, you cannot use very many symbols over Z because otherwise uh, it, can, it can be uh, confused with the notation of a conjugation, right? But if you think of the vector, and this is the point, okay, here. Good. Well. We have already studied, I think, that, well, the, 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 the Cartesian coordinates are not the only ones you can, you can use for vectors. You can also use polar coordinates. Hmm? What, where are the advantages and disadvantages of this choice? Well, in some cases you have advantages, and in some others you are creating disadvantages. First of all, uh, you cannot represent any vector of the plane using polar coordinates, and this is obvious. The origin has no polar coordinates. All, all, only in modulus is zero, but not the, the angle. Huh? The angle is not defined. Hmm? So there is, no there is no correspondence with the, uh, ortho, with the Cartesian, Cartesian coordinates. Huh? However, if we are taking Z and C, different from the origin, we can define the polar coordinates. And namely, Z, uh, okay, write it this way, Z plus I and Z. Uh, we have this angle here theta, this is modulus of z, it's the length of the vector. The only vector which has modulus zero is the, the, the zero vector. Remember that we define a modulus of a complex number to be the sum of two squares, of two squares of real numbers. So in order to be zero, it has to be simultaneously zero, a, like the real part and the imaginary part. 
Huh? Good. So, <coughs> while some uh, very basic uh, stuff in calculus tells us that, well, there are two functions, huh? to uh, cosine and, and sine, which helps you a lot to, to make the correspondence. So the real part of z as the modulus of z times cosine of theta. And the imaginary part of z is modulus of z times sine of, of theta. Hmm? Well, If z is not um, is not the origin, uh, to z we can associate a pair of numbers, uh, are non-negative rho, and the theta, which is between zero to two pi. But, as you all know, the, the difficulty is that there are several determinations of the angles, okay? So we have to, to make a choice, and this is one, this is the preferred choice, normally preferred choice of the angle, and in this case it is called argument, okay? Principal argument, but you can have very many because these two functions here are periodic and of period two pi. Okay, so this phi is called argument, sometimes also the principal argument, because we have this restriction between 0 and 2 pi of z, and rho is modulus. Is d modulus of z. Okay. And remember, the modulus of z is zero if and only if z is zero, so that in some sense you can extend polar coordinates saying that when rho is zero, no determination of the argument, but well, it means that we are considering the only, the only um, vector, okay? which has this property, it is the origin. Good. Now, what is, okay. Relations between the two coordinates. We have already one. So if z is a plus i b, rho is, by definition, the square root of a squared plus b squared. Uh, okay, let me, let me say it this way. Starting with polar coordinates, we immediately obtain a real imaginary part. Take rho, cos theta, and you have the imaginary, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the real part. Rho sin theta, and you have the imaginary part. So now we are doing the opposite, okay, description. We start from the real imaginary part, A and B, and we want to have rho and theta. We are assuming that, okay, A and B, A times B is, okay, after this way. A and B are real numbers, but not zero. Okay. Um, Okay, if this is the case, then theta is also determined, and is, well, remember that I said that the real part of z is rho cos theta, and imaginary part of z is rho sin theta. That is, this is A, and this is B. Okay, I'm assuming that both numbers are not zero, so in particular A is not zero, and I can take the ratio, b over a. b over a is meaningful. And rho and rho cancel, so I have sin theta over cos theta. 
b over a sin theta over cos theta. So theta is arctan of b over a. Well, if p is 0, well, it's not a big, big problem because, well, arctan is defined for 0. It's 0, right? So if p is 0, still OK. OK? Yes? OK, you are correct. Good question. OK. He is pointing out that I, I, um, I'm, I'm taking an, an inverse function of the, tan the tangent function, which is not de defined uniquely. It's multivalued function, correct. All right. So s since I'm trying to have the argument, the principal argument, I'm considering the arctan to be the function defined on the real axis and with value in between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay, so the principle, okay? Or, if you prefer, you're correct, you have to add something like mod 2 pi. Hmm? Okay? Good, good question. But this is exactly the problem with polar coordinates uh, in, in, any, in, any, in any setting. <laughs> it's a matter of choosing, of choosing, sorry, of choosing, it's a matter of uh, choice of the principal. Either you take in between 0 and 2 pi or minus uh, pi pi, okay. Okay, good, thank you. However, <clears throat> what I'm saying is that b equal to 0 is not a big problem for the inversion of that tang the tangent. Huh? The problem is then when a is zero. Okay, a and b comp both zero is not as, uh, is not considered. Okay, because in this case we are taking the origin and the origin has no argument. But when a is zero, well, it depends on the sign of b to to, to determine an argument. If b is positive, pi over, pi over two. If b is negative, is three pi over two. Okay, 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 okay. If a is zero, b not zero. Right, b positive means theta is pi over two. B negative if theta is. Okay. Now, this is not a. Um, this is. Um, uh, to say, this cannot justify all this calculation. I mean, the, well, we don't have. I, I don't see any advantage to take this angle uh, angle instead of two two real numbers, with all the restriction, with all the problems of the argument. Well, the very good observation is the following: take two numbers, complex numbers, using the um, polar coordinates. So. I put uh, an index i, uh, sorry, an index 1 for the first. So rho 1, theta 1 is the coordinate of, the, of z, z1. And rho 2, theta 2, the coordinates, the polar coordinates, sorry, of the second complex numbers complex number. Well, <clears throat> let me make this calculation, which is probably familiar to you. Take the multiplication. And we have row 1, row 2, and then cos theta 1, cos theta 2, then minus sin theta 1, sin theta 2, plus i and I put another uh, parenthesis, cos theta 1 sin theta 2 plus sin theta 1 cos theta 2. Okay. And therefore, 
and the product of two complex numbers using polar coordinates, we obtain that the moduli are the, the moduli of the two, the two complex numbers are multiplied to obtain the modulus, of, which is something we already knew, okay? What about the argument? Here I recognize that this is cos of the sum of the angles, good. And here is sinus of the sum of the angles. Therefore, in polar coordinates, the product has these coordinates. Multiplication of the moduli and the sum of the argument. Okay, I'm running out my time, but okay. I think that this is something you can verify. So take several. complex numbers using this representation and verify that if you multiply them j1 to n z1 sorry z1 <coughs> zn gives you this complex number Okay, by induction you can prove this. In particular, we have that if z is rho cos theta plus i sin theta, z squared is rho squared cos 2 theta plus i sin 2 theta. And more in general, e to the power n is rho to the power n cos n times theta plus i see, n times theta. And this is known as the Moivre formula. Okay? And this is very helpful in the calculation of roots of equations, okay? Quadrat cubic equation, quadratic equation. So I take <coughs> this equation. This is an equation in the complex setting. Huh? It's not something you can compare to the so we are looking for a number whose square is equal to mine to is, is, is whose square sorry is equal to i. I is a complex number. Well, I adopt the polar coordinate for z, and I use the Moiv formula. I know that z squared is rho squared cos 2 theta plus i sin 2 theta. Okay, and then this equation is equivalent to to this. Okay? So that <coughs> we have rho squared has to be 1. Hmm? Okay, if you want, you have to compare the real and the imaginary parts. Two 
remember that two, any complex number is an ordered pair of real numbers. Okay? There is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So two complex numbers coincide if and only if they have the same real and imaginary part. So in this case, I have to do this. I have to consider that the real part on the right hand side is zero, right? Okay. And on, on the right hand side, on the left hand oh, sorry, on the right hand side is zero, but on the left hand side is rho, rho squared cos two theta. On the left hand side, the imaginary part is this rho squared sine two theta, and on the right hand side is one. Okay. So if rho squared is equal to one, it has to be one. Huh? It has to be one. Hmm? There is no other choice. And cos two theta has to be zero. So the only <coughs> possibilities left are theta equal to pi over 4, okay, or theta equal to plus pi, huh? so uh, 3 over 4 pi, correct? Therefore, the, the, the two solutions of this quadratic equation in the, in the complex number is, is, so theta is either minus or okay. Uh, sorry, uh, sure. One plus one plus four is five, right? Sure. Yes. I add pi to pi over four. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And now it's important to remember that uh, four plus one is five is no three. Well, sweet, sweet. Pardon me. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't understand. Uh, the, the letter K is in, uh, in Z. Uh, okay. Uh, your colleague pointed out that I made a mistake, and I, I of course, I, I, I recognize it was a mistake. P over 4 solves this, both, these two conditions, but also. Uh, pi, sorry, pi over four solves these two equations, but also pi over four plus pi. And I forgot to, 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 to add four to one to obtain five over four pi as a square. Three over four is not correct, okay? Okay, check it. All right, so last exercise is we solve this. Uh, what if I have this? To solve. Okay. So natural answer is of course one is a solution, which is a complex number. It is also a real number. Okay. Is there any other solution in the complex numbers for this cubic equation with real coefficients? A bit different from the other, but I invite you to make use of the Moivre formula, and we'll. Well, we'll see, or you'll see. So we, we can see, say now, <laughs> that beside the real solution one, there are two other solutions. Okay, and these two solutions are also conjugate. Okay, so I think that I stop here. So probably some of you are uh, is really bored by this first introduction, but. Um, so 
just to give you an idea, what we are going to do is um, we have a set with some algebra, very good algebraic properties. We want to make some geometry and analysis on this set. This is the main subject of, of complex analysis. Uh, but uh, of course, we are also inspired by what we have done on the real numbers. And on the real numbers, we have extended the real numbers hmm, to the extended real line, adding two symbols, plus infinity and minus infinity. Okay? Because when you are considering limits uh, of sequences of real numbers, you have, in some cases these are convergent, in others are not. And when they diverge to something which is very big in modulus, then you have to, to use a symbol, okay, to describe this. Um, we have to do the same, but we have to add something to a plane. Okay, so the next, next task is to extend the complex numbers to the Riemann sphere and then to define a, met, um, a, a way to measure distances between points. In such a way we'll in introduce a metric structure on this extended plane, okay? And from the metric structure we also obtain the topology, which do not, will luckily be a good topology. <laughs> and starting from this, we can then uh, study the theory of convergence in C and, and um, of, of sequences of points, so of anything, okay? So this is, this is then, uh, uh, the project for the next lesson, to introduce, to extend the complex plane to a complex um, Riemann sphere, and to introduce a, me a way to measure distances, okay? Are you all familiar with this stuff? Please, confess. You already know this very much. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Are you all? Have you all studied holomorphic functions in uh, one complex variable? All, no. Well, there is at least one, uh, one singularity in some of this, okay. In several complex variables? No, none. Pardon me? Even in one complex variable or in several complex variables? In several, okay. But in one complex you have already. So, uh, have you studied harmonic functions? No. Okay. Have you studied Riemann surfaces? No. No. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, if I say Mebius transformation, is it something you. What? Mebius. Mebius, conformal mapping, okay. Conformal mapping. conformal mapping is more general. Mebius, Mebius transformation, Mebius. No. Conformal mapping. Automorphism of the plane of the disk, no. Well, just to know, it's not, it's not <laughs> you, you can learn it. You know? <laughs> um, Morera theorem, if I say Morera. Mebius, Mebius. Mebius. Yeah, yeah. Mebius. Okay. 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 Fractional linear, or linear fractional linear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, poles, residues. Yeah. Okay. So the class is not very homogeneous. I have to confess. For some of you, part of the course will be somehow trivial. Uh, but I, I'll try to to add some some new comments on, on what you already know, okay? Otherwise, it is difficult for those who, don't, who haven't ever heard of uh, 
holomorphic function theory, uh, something in several complex variables. Maybe I, I ask the other, the other staff what is better to do for you, okay? Okay, we'll see, uh, okay, we'll meet here on Friday morning, same, uh, and then uh, on next Friday, right? So not, to, not in two days, but in 10 days. Okay, because on Monday then the, you are full of lessons, all right? Okay, I think that we can stop here.